Hello. How are you? It's time for another Gita video. And uh, before I get right into the text, I wanted to to remind you of what we've seen so far in this chapter. We've done two videos. And in the first video, um, the first three verses of the chapter, you see Krishna talking about the difference between one type of renunciation and another, between the kind of um, cheap renunciation of just giving up stuff, right? Giving up stuff that you're going to do or giving up material possessions or whatever um, and hoping that that will somehow get you something. And the more profound renunciation of giving up your own um, inferior person. In the second video, which are the next two verses, uh, four and five, Krishna turns around and starts talking about the difference between yoga and witnessing. And uh, so what he's talking about here is because some people uh, were connecting renunciation, would have connected renunciation to witnessing. And um, talking about renunciation and yoga as two different things, right? Um, so he, he explains that yoga and witnessing, although they appear to be moving in opposite directions, where witnessing is stepping out of a situation and yoga is uniting to a situation, um, they're in fact producing the same thing and one requires the other. So now you're going to see in the next two verses, he goes back to talking about renunciation. But you have to keep in mind what he's just said in the last couple of verses. So, in verse 6 and 7, he says, But simply renouncing all things, without taking up yoga, great warrior, can afflict you with misery. One who practices yoga will be engaged. He can attain Brahma easily that way. A pure soul Practicing yoga is centered in his soul, having conquered the senses. He will have compassion to all living beings, and though he acts, he will never become attached. So, here he's back to talking about renunciation. But what he's talking about now is he say, okay, so what happens first to the people that are doing renunciation without actually engaging in yoga and within the context of understanding that yoga and witnessing are the same thing and that they're different from renunciation, right? Um, people who are doing that um, can be afflicted with misery, right? A lot of them are miserable because their idea of spirituality is if I give up stuff, then somehow I'm going to get a some kind of a magical reward um, and these are the people that deny themselves things and then usually demand that other people deny themselves things, right? Um, we're not talking here about any a kind of productive renunciation. A renunciation that's productive has to come from within your being, not because you read somewhere, okay, well, you know, uh, Jesus or Krishna or, or Allah or Buddha or whoever doesn't want you to eat meat or doesn't want you to, to smoke or doesn't want you to have sex, right? Or doesn't want you to own a color TV. And so you give up these things thinking that then that means you're going to get something special, right? And what the, the one special thing you get out of that is this kind of sense of superiority. So you now are depending on everybody not thinking you look ridiculous for whatever you've done, right? Uh, there's a story that my guru used to t talk about where um, there had been a guy who had been in some kind of accident and he lost his nose, right? His nose was like cut off or something and it was, he was hideously deformed. And he found himself basically an outcast, right? He was just, everybody thought he was so horrific, right? That they didn't want to be near him. Women didn't want him, you know. Um, people couldn't stand to be around him. Little children were afraid of him. 
until he decided to put on some robes, and he sat under a tree, and he began to look a little bit like a holy man. He was a holy man without a nose, right? And so then people were curious, and they started coming up to him, and he started to to explain that that he achieved transcendent enlightenment by by removing his nose, but not just any, you know, not any removal of nose would do. You'd have to do a whole special process of removing the nose, and uh, that it depended on this, you know, his, his, he knew the way, other people didn't know the way, right? And so people suddenly were giving him stuff, they were sitting at his feet, they, they still, you know, he was still just as hideous to look at, but all of a sudden they thought he was a great wise spiritual teacher for not having a nose, right? And he had, you know, as tends to happen, he ended up having certain people that were more fanatical than others, and one of them was a really, really dedicated follower that wanted to do anything he'd say, right? And he kept putting putting off tasks on him, but he'd already said, you know, cutting off the nose is the way to become one with God, right? So there was no kind of getting around that, and, and there was... Uh, one student that started giving him money and giving him things and taking care of him and doing everything for him and asked him, when are you going to show me how to cut off my nose in a way that will make me um, super spiritual, right? And he, he kind of kept trying to put it off, but eventually it was just impossible to put off any longer. So he said, okay, well, we're going to have to go on a pilgrimage halfway up the mountain and then we'll, we're going we're gonna to do something there. And so he took him up there. And um, he said, all right, now you have to use this special, <clears throat> this special curved knife and you have to cut off your nose while you're reciting a mantra. And then the moment you do this, you're going to become awakened, right? And so the guy cuts off his own nose. It's horrible, you know, disgusting, everything that's happening to him. He's, he's terrified right after he does it because he doesn't feel like anything's changed. He says, what's happening? You know, it, doesn't, it didn't work. It didn't work for me. And he said, no, it, it worked for you. Um, the thing is that, you know, there's, I was just making it all up. I was just lying. I was a fake, a fake teacher, right? Um, and you know, the, the guy was, I'm going to, you know, he was furious. He's like, I'm going to kill you. You, you, you. I cut off my own nose for you, right? And he said, yeah, but now you see you're in on it too, right? And you can either be known from now, for now, from now on as, the idiot that got cut off his own nose for a fraud and who's going to be rejected by everyone. Everyone's going to think that you look horrible because you look horrible now and you ruin your life. Or you can also be the great awakened master and go over to the next town and pretend because you're missing a nose too that you've been shown the secret method. Right? And this guy, of course, you know, he ended up joining the scam because that was the, that was the way it worked, right? So be wary, I guess the, the lesson here is, first of all, be wary of guys without noses, but also be wary of any kind of a spiritual teaching that is um, based on some kind of self-mutilation, right? And whether that self-mutilation is a literal thing like cutting off the nose, right? Um, or uh, some other kind of self-renunciation that, that is meant to somehow be the point in and of itself, right? That if you're, if you deny yourself everything nice, then you're going to be more spiritual because you've denied yourself everything nice. Your, your psychology will force you to think that, well, I must be more spiritual. I've stopped dancing. I've stopped singing. I've stopped playing music. I've stopped eating meat. I've stopped eating pork. I've stopped uh, drinking wine. I've stopped doing, you know, watching TV. I've stopped masturbating. I've stopped driving a car. And, and now I must be super duper spiritual because otherwise I'm just an idiot who cut off my own nose, right? You don't want to be that guy, but millions of people throughout the world are exactly that guy. And then the problem is this is all based on the same thing that the guy who cut off his nose is based on is, is, um, to have a sense of acceptance and to suddenly look from being someone that's a loser to being someone who's respectable. So in your urge to be respectable, you're going to join this religion, join this movement that's going to deny it. You're, you're going to deny yourself all kinds of things. You're going to become miserable, as the, the Gita says. Um, 
And then you're going to force other people to imagine that that's spiritual too. And so it's not enough for you to deny yourself things. You're going to have to deny things for other people. It's not enough that you don't eat pork. You're going to have to force everyone else not to eat pork. It's not enough that you don't drink. You're going to have to force everybody else to stop drinking, right? It's not enough that, that you're not engaged in sex with people whenever you feel like it. You're going to have to force everybody else to stop having sex too. And so all of these these things, this Puritanism, um, Krishna's identifying it as a, as a false path, as a path that only leads to misery. Now, if you're doing the other type of renunciation, that's totally different. Because the other type of renunciation isn't about trying to remove something from your, your environment or your possessions or your things. It's about trying to transcend yourself, and that might involve certain restrictions, right? But now, if you're engaging in a spiritual practice where you are fasting, for example, right? You're cutting down on food. You're doing this within the sense of purpose of your self-transformation. You're doing this as a way not to, not because somebody else said so, but first of all, because it comes from within yourself to do it. And second, because you're doing it with a very specific and focused purpose in mind, right? You're, you're doing it in order to, you're practicing a discipline in order to obtain a different level of awareness. And so this is where Krishna says that if you're going to re do renunciation, you have to do renunciation within the taking up of yoga. If you practice yoga, you will be engaged. You are connected to the world, and you're a part of the world, and you're doing things within the world. You're not renouncing the world. Um, you're using the world as your playing field, your operating field, your lab, your place to experiment for you to transform your consciousness. And that's the way that you can attain Brahma easily. So a pure soul... Uh, practicing yoga, um, you're going to be centered within your own being. You're not worried, first of all, about what the other guy is doing. You don't care about whether you have respectability or not. If 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 I was worried about whether I had respectability or not, I I probably I would not be doing these videos. <laughs> um, you you have conquered the senses. And that, that means that you've engaged in practices that unite you to your senses. You're present. You've shown up. You'll have compassion to all living beings. And although you act, you won't become attached. Because you'll know, and, and you'll be able, within that, to do the right kind of renunciation. Because you'll know what's really necessary for renouncing and what isn't. If you, if you aren't engaging in that practice, if that's not the center of it, if, if, if just like giving up stuff or, or, you know, doing stuff that amounts to giving up stuff, to giving up your time, to giving up your effort, and this could even be a real practice, right? But if you're not in the, doing it in the right sense, if you're doing Qigong four times a day, and it's a real Qigong system, but you're doing it because you think that you have to, and that if you just do it four times a day, then that's going to change your life or whatever, right? And so you're just going there and doing it. You don't really feel like doing it, but you're doing it because you heard somebody told you, you read in a book or something like that, that if you do this four times a day, then you'll become enlightened, right? Um, you're you're essentially engaging in an act of renunciation there. You're giving up your fun. You're giving up your time. You're, you're engaging in an obligation that you don't want to engage in. Um, and it's all the wrong type of renunciation. Whereas if you're engaging in, in the same practice, exact same thing, you're doing, uh, you're doing Qigong four times a day, but you're doing it showing up, being present. You're, you're doing it not because you heard about something from somewhere else, but, but because the doing it itself is what is changing you. Then that's the type of renunciation. You're still engaged in a kind of renunciation because you're engaged in a kind of a discipline, a discipline of your life. <clears throat> But it's one that's now serving a purpose, right? Um, there are some 
schools within you know the 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 branches of Hinduism that uh, venerate the Gita that believe that just by repeatedly chanting, if you chant 144,000 times a day, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, and so on and so forth, um, then that will, that's all you need. You're going to be united to Krishna, and then when you die, you're going to be part of the Supreme Godhead of Krishna or something like that, right? Um, and I, what I would say to that is you could, you could repeat a mantra until your throat dries up, until your tongue falls out. Um, and, if, and, it, and it could be possible that you will have gained nothing by doing that. Nothing at all. Because if you're repeating a mantra without being present, without being loving, without engaging, you know, love, union, and yoga are all the same word. That's very important. Love, union, and yoga are all the same word. If you're engaging in it, then you don't need to do it 144,000 times. You can probably do it a lot less than that, um, and it will have a huge effect on you. Whereas if you're one of these false renouncers, you could be doing, you know, um, 108 times 108 the mantra, the Hare Krishna mantra, every day of your life for 30 years and you will have gained nothing at all. You'll have been as bad or worse than when you started because you've probably become a miserable person in the process. You have to connect to life. If you aren't connected to life, how can you know what's natural? How can you know where to renounce or where not to renounce? So if you're doing something else before you start a practice involving witnessing, involving concentration, involving the basic practice of, of, of awareness, then you're just engaging in a, in a plan to get yourself further away from where you have to be. But people who are practicing, who are engaged, they're not... They're going to be centered within themselves. So they'll know exactly what needs to actually be renounced and how. And it won't feel the same way. It's not, you know, you, you know a renunciation is a false renunciation if it feels like just an obligation to you. I'm not saying that certain disciplines can't be tough. There can certainly be a lot of days when you're engaging in a legitimate discipline of practice uh, which might involve not doing something or might involve doing something by obligation, right? Um, where it'll still, it'll feel like a lot of work to get there, to do it, to get up and do the, the Qigong practice, to get up and do the yoga, to get up and do the chanting. Uh, and you're like, oh, I don't really feel like doing this, but you go and you sit down and you do it anyways, but you're doing it because deep within yourself, there is an understanding, an impulse to do it, right? Uh, whereas if the, all you're thinking about is kind of the purpose at the end. If you like get up and you don't feel like doing it, be like, oh, if I don't do it, I won't be, I won't go to heaven, I won't become enlightened, I won't join the supreme godhead, right? I won't be X, right? Um, then that's not a legitimate renunciation. Um, so they can look like the same thing, but they'll have totally different purposes. You have to be. First, engaging in a comfortable union within yourself to be able to unite to the divine, to be able to unite to the world. You have to unite to all three things, the, the world, the human, and heaven, right? In, in the I Ching, you see that the, the six lines of the hexagram, the first two are the world, the second two are humanity, the, the, the third two are heaven. And um, this is a, a kind of a a scale that we see repeated over and over again. We're the bridge, and you have to engage in all of it. Um, while you're practicing, you have to practice in a compassionate way. And that means, first of all, being compassionate for yourself. You need to treat yourself like you would want to treat someone you care a lot about. And you'd think, well, I'm not, you know, I obviously care about myself, right? But uh, what I mean is that a lot of people will put um, will put pressures on themselves and, and put themselves down and look at themselves in a way um, 
and I'm not talking about shallow and fake self-esteem here, but they'll, they'll look at themselves in a way that they would never judge another person um, and, and would, will treat themselves as inadequate um, in a way that they would never treat somebody else. Right? So don't just assume you're wonderful, but at the same time, don't treat yourself like dirt. Right? Um, and then you can engage in that same sense of compassion to everybody around you, which doesn't mean being nice to everybody. Compassion has nothing to do with being nice to everybody. It has to do with caring about other people, right? And a lot of times caring about other people could mean helping others. A lot of times it will mean um, being showing kindnesses to others. Sometimes it will mean being harsh with others, right? Um, if, if, again, if you're not centered within yourself, if you haven't engaged in awareness, how will you know what's the right way to be compassionate? Because if you're not aware of yourself, you're not, you don't know how to be compassionate with yourself even, so much less with other people. Your ideas of compassion will be all wrong. You'll give stuff to people who getting stuff will only help to kill them faster, right? You'll enable addicts and drunks or whatever. Or you're, you'll you'll um, be strict with people who need gentleness um, or vice versa. So all of this depends first and foremost on that union of awareness, on, on witnessing and on concentration, on yoga and on, and on um, meditation. If you do those things first, and within that engage in a practice of virtue, engage in a union with the world, um, then that changes everything about how you do everything else, including renunciation and including how you interact with other people. So this is the key. Um, whereas the other path of just, you know, giving up things as renunciation or strictures, rules, but without consciousness, that's, that's not a legitimate, you know, you're not freeing yourself from any kind of attachment there. Someone who's a meditator um, and works on themselves, they eventually become liberated from their attachment, not in the sense that they've necessarily given up anything, but in the sense that that thing no longer can rule them because they are present, they are here and in the moment. Whereas somebody else might give something up and yet not attain presence in the moment. They've just stopped, you know, they've stopped smoking or stopped drinking, but it hasn't made them any more present in the moment. So this is not um, any less attached. You're still just as attached before. In fact, you're probably uh, redirecting your resentment over the fact that now you can't drink or smoke or drink Coca-Cola or have sex or whatever, right? You're, you're engaging, uh, you're, you're, you're still engaging with all of those things. You haven't renounced anything really. You haven't removed any attachment really. So the first place, renunciation has to come after yoga after union and within this constant process of cultivation of practicing with um, changing yourself from within through witnessing and through yoga and then based on that deciding how you change your life and how you rearrange things around you and what you renounce or what you don't renounce So that's everything for today. I hope you like this kind of long video compared to the last one, certainly. If you, uh, if you did like the video, please check out the rest of the channel, including this, uh, the playlist for the Bhagavad Gita lectures. And check out especially the playlist for the Yipa Society. And if you're looking for what I was just talking about in this video, for a whole program of cultivation and a way to transform yourself, to work yourself out and to develop consciousness and connection and virtue and no nose cutting whatsoever is involved, then uh, please uh, look into the EFA Society and get in touch with me if you're, if you're interested in, in uh, entering that kind of a training. Thank you very much.